And the title of today's webinar is, as you all know, Graduate Study Abroad. And a lot of you may have an interest in pursuing a degree outside of the United States or outside of your home country. So we believe that this will be, we hope that this will be of help to you. I am Amy Flatten. I'm the Director of International Affairs for the American Physical Society, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, just a little bit of background. The APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students working physicists and educators. So that's some background on the program in general, but today's presentation features Mike Wallach, who has a dual PhD program between Paris Tech and the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Today we're going to talk, to, talk about Mike's experiences in this type of program, hopefully giving you some ideas of what you may want to consider if you were to pursue a similar type of program and some practical advice on dealing with issues common to students studying abroad. So some logistical information. After the interview portion of the broadcast, which is about 30 minutes, Mike and I will talk, the remainder of the program will belong to you and for your questions and, and uh, Q&A sessions. Because of the number of people that may be attending, we're only accepting text questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please just type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. I also want to remind our listeners that you can submit a question through the questions panel throughout the entire webinar, and we'll try and get to all of your questions. We'll do our best to cover all the questions that you submit, but we want to apologize ahead of time if we're unable to cover everything. Lastly, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after today's event. And we really encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting the webinar so that we can improve our ability to provide you with these valuable services. So please take some time and do that. So with that, let's get started. And I'll give you a little bit of background with Mike, and then I'll ask him some really hard questions, and I'll... Hopefully, you'll be emailing us with some as well. But some background on Mike. Mike is currently enrolled, enrolled in a dual PhD program, like we said, between the University of Alabama and Paris Tech in France, where he is developing nanocomposite coatings for use in the cutting tool and biomedical industry. At the end of this program, fall of 2012, he will be awarded a doctorate in physics from UAB, University of Alabama, and a doctorate degree in material science engineering from Paris Tech. Before enrolling in his current doctoral program, Mike received his Master's of Science in Physics, also from University of Alabama, and his Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Eastern Michigan University. Mike has published numerous articles on nanostructures and has presented his research at several national and international symposia. He's an also an active member of the APS, and he served as secretary for the Forum on Graduate Student Affairs, and is serving currently as ex officio advisor to the Committee on Careers and Professional Development. So let's get started, because I know a lot of you might be considering uh, pursuing a degree such as a program such as Mike or other opportunities outside your home country. So Mike, let me start off by asking, what were you thinking? You left your masters and somehow you are now you're in France. Give us the thought process for other people who are thinking of considering the same thing. You left your masters, then what? Well first off, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, Basically, I, uh, I completed my master's at University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and I was looking to uh, go somewhere else to complete my degree, something, you know, something different, uh, the variety is the spice of life, as they say. And was um, this just so a I, personal interest or a professional interest or both? Did you have uh, a both. yen to a uh, urine? Okay. Both, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Although, to be honest, uh, I didn't wander far. I ended up at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, which is an hour away from Tuscaloosa where I did my master's. But, uh, and how did you, you end up at Birmingham? 
Um, basically, I applied there and several other schools and was accepted, and they had they had several options that looked very good, and this was one of them, actually. Um, my current advisor, my U.S. advisor, uh, I went and he was one of the faculty members I had met, and he mentioned this particular program. He was working on the general agreement between Paris Tech and the University of Alabama system at the time, mm -hmm. um, which was about a year in process of getting this all together for the general memorandum between the schools on the administrative level. Um, and he mentioned this, and both me and my wife thought it would be an awesome opportunity. Well, let me back up a bit. So when you decided to select the University of Alabama Birmingham for your doctoral degree, was that with the knowledge that you may have the opportunity to go to Paris Tech, or did that come about once you had accepted the offer to pursue your degree at University of Alabama, UAB? At the time when I accepted the offer, it wasn't, it was still in process, so there wasn't a guarantee. Okay. Um, it wasn't like, oh, if I come here, I'm going to, to Paris Tech. Um, it was still in process. It was probable, but not likely. Um, now, Okay. Did other schools that you have applied for, and from what our earlier conversations, it was Paris Tech because UAB and Paris Tech were working on an agreement, but it wasn't finalized yet, so you may or may not be able to take advantage of it. Were your other PhD programs at other schools that you were considering, did they also have what's called a coup uh, program, a joint program with another university overseas? No. Okay. No, UAB was the only one working on that at the time. Um, I have found looking at other schools that the cotutel between the French and the U.S. is actually something relatively rare, um, something new, whereas here in Europe it's actually very normal to do cotutel uh, between different schools. And in Europe, are they usually between two European institutions or...? Um, it, it depends. In, in France in particular, it is usually either it is actually between Europe or uh, North Africa because France actually has a very long history with that part with Tunisia and Morocco and Algeria. Um, actually, most of my colleagues that I work with here in Cluny are Tunisian, Algerian, and Moroccan. So if students hear the term coup de tel, that essentially means a joint program between you two universities from different countries. And this is something that's newly being um, pursued in the United States. Not a lot of schools that you encountered had those agreements established, correct? Correct. Okay. So is that one of the things that attracted to you, you to UAB was this oppor potential opportunity? Granted, you had said the agreement hadn't been worked out, but the potential for a uh, joint degree with Paris Tech. Yes. It was, it was definitely a, a, a good spur in that direction. Wonderful. So you're at UAB, and I recognize that the agreement wasn't finalized. So what were the things that you had to do in preparation should it be finalized? Um, basically, well, first off, I had to pass qualifiers um, like everybody else does. Sure. Um, one thing with any of these agreements with the French is that you need to have a research master's before the French will accept you. Um, that is actually standard even if you apply straight to a French university for your doctorate. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you actually need to have the master's already done and it should be a research master's, not a, a, what they call, usually call a plan two master's, i.e. you pass the qualifiers and you get your master's degree. Right. Um, but so if you have, that was one thing which I already had going. And then the other thing was actually starting to get paperwork together um, for the school for Paris Tech because you still have to go through a partial, not the full application process that you would normally do, but a partial application process um, which requires a number of documents to be translated into French. Oh, I see. Sure. And all of those have to be certified. Mm -hmm. So basically, luckily, uh, we have a great number of uh, great professors that were very helpful at UAB. Um, one of our associate deans is actually a professor of French uh, language. So she actually went ahead and 
uh, did a lot of those translations. And then we have a public notary for international affairs that is free of charge for students and took care of that. Um, because when you look at the schools, they will say that you have to have certified translation. That is not a service that is typically provided in the United States. Whereas if you go to like the UK, they actually have businesses that are certified translators to translate documents. Um, so basically you have to utilize whatever you can. In this case, my university, UAB, was very helpful. So no going to Google Translate, huh? <laughs> you have to go through the official channels. Yeah, unfortunately you have to go through the official channels because the French like everything to be stamped. <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds like it was a, a very rigorous process just logistically to get the application submitted. What was your motivating factor for going to this kind of trouble to be able to study in France? Was it, I know we touched on this earlier, but can you elaborate on, was it the academics or what was it about the academics? What was it about the uh, travel experience, the cultural experience? Yeah, what made you decide to go pursue this coup de tel as opposed to just plowing through your PhD at UAB? Um, it was basically a combination of, of what you just said. Is, is one the, it, it's always good to broaden your horizons no matter what you do for a living, um, mm -hmm. both personally and professionally. And to be honest, even NSF, a lot of NSF programs for grants and whatnot are starting to stress international collaborations. Um, so, and it just makes sense just to, you know, I mean, even doing collaborations within the states, you know, the more people, the merrier. Um, we actually already had established collaborations with Paris Tech just as research-wise. Um, colleagues here, we had already done work with them before. Um, so just the combination of, of both having that established relationship and expanding it, and then also on top of that, the, the academics. Uh, Paris Tech is actually a conglomerate of 12 of the Grand Ecoli. And the Grand Ecoli are basically the cream of the crop of French education. Um, going through a Grand Ecoli is effectively the same as going through MIT or an Ivy League school or Oxford or Cambridge. Um, Wonderful. It is, it is the top level you can do in France. So you're basically getting uh, one of the highest level international degrees from Paris Tech, consequently. Correct. Yes. Well, and it has the other sort of advantages that I will have both a physics degree and an engineering degree, so it actually will double my job prospects when I get my degrees. Well, and that was another thing that I was going to ask you. I can understand how the experience would be very enriching just having the cultural experience, and I'll have some questions about that in a moment. But since you touched on it, when you, you, when you leave the degree program and you're granted your degrees, as you just said, it'll expand your uh, job prospects, but can you elaborate a little bit more on your thinking? Well, you had mentioned because you'll have an engineering and a science degree, but what else do you think will be advantageous to you or attractive to employers when they see this? Um, well, so the two degrees. Um, the international collaboration, I literally have now contacts in, in several places in the States, in France, Poland, Finland, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, and Czech Republic. Um, I have people that I've worked with throughout that, so I actually have a very large network um, that I can tap into and take advantage of both for job networking and, and finding a job, and also once I have a job, of help of basically spreading around and, and getting other getting people to help out with the research, mm -hmm. um, which will reduce the cost the monetary cost of wherever I'm working, if I can go ahead and send a sample to Poland and get the work done, you know, and they send me stuff and I do work, it's a lot more cost effective than, say, me going to another user facility and having to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that will help when, when, when employers look like I have a very large network uh, that could be very attractive to a number of people. Um, on top of that also, by the end of this, I hope I will actually be fairly fluent in a, in a second language, uh, in this case French, um, which 
that just that additionally is another helpful thing to have is, is the, the, the additional language skills. Now, given this experience that you've had in France, has it changed your perspectives on U.S. science? And if so, how? Um, not really. I mean, we, we all basically do the same things and the same type of things. Um, and I was actually looking even on the funding level, um, France puts about 2% of their GDP into public and private research. Mm -hmm. um, which is actually very comparable to what the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. So, reality, it, it's it's actually not that much different um, the way we do things and and, and what we do. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even the amount of money that we spend on it. Has it changed your perspective on starting your career or building your career in the United States at a home institution here in the U.S. and collaborating with overseas partners or? Would you prefer to start your career at a, a European or another institution based outside of the United States? I would say it's not really changed my mind, but it's opened the additional door. I see. Um, I've, I've always, you know, when I was, for lack of a better word, a puppy physicist, um, thought about, you know, where I would end up and, and that in U.S. facilities were always towards the top of that list. Now I have, I will have a European degree, so that actually opens off the same thing. It opens additional doors in the fact that now I can apply. I mean, I could apply to European jobs with a U.S. degree, and vice versa. You can apply either way. But having that additional exposure and experience um, helps open that door and get your foot in the door on, on even here in Europe. So now instead of just focusing on U.S. facilities to start degree, I, I can focus on a much larger playing field, both Europe and U.S. I don't have a particular preference okay. where I start, per se. Um, it's more about where I can find a meaningful, something meaningful for me to do. And you've also uh, made yourself more attractive to um, other institutions outside of the United States with this experience? Correct. Let me, we've talked a little bit about how this may affect things post your PhD, but why don't you give the students and some listeners some background on how the program was implemented, the pragmatic details. Did you do a year at Paris Tech, two years at Paris Tech? How did you balance things between UAB and Paris Tech? Okay. Um, one thing, this will all be what I'm going to say will be unique to me when after the general agreement then there is a specific agreement that will detail everything that the student has to do. Like I have a specific agreement that tells me when I'm going to, I am defending October 2012. I don't have a choice. It's in my contract of when I'm going to defend. Um, I spend half my time at Paris Tech and half my time at UAB and that has been split up to where I spent my first year at UAB, and I spent six months here in, in Paris Tech in Cluny, which is actually near Lyon, uh, south central France, basically. Um, then I spent another, I went back, that was basically September through March of this year, of 2010 to 2011, and then I went back for six months, and now I'm in my final year, um, and I'm, I spend that here in, in France. So this is all basically prescribed in the agreement? Correct. That's a little in intimidating, at least for experimentalists, having to uh, <laughs> a date for your dissertation. <laughs> it, it is very intimidating because equipment breaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although equipment breaks, actually it was uh, last year when I was here in Clooney, uh, the equipment, my deposition machine was down for two months. So but, well, uh, you can get extensions. It, it Both schools allow that, and it is stipulated in the contract that stuff can be unforeseen, unforeseen stuff may change that date. But mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be interested. You're going to whet their appetite for similar experiences. Uh, just curious, how do you find schools in the United States that have these programs? Um, to be honest, I have no idea. Okay. Um, I actually just basically, for lack of a word, fell into this one. 
Okay. Um, one thing I, you could do is to look for, um, you could go to a website, it's called campusfrance.org, um, and it, uh, and basically it gives all kinds of information about how, uh, uh studying in France. Okay. And one thing you could do is, is look at different French institutions and see if they have agreements with different institutions here in the U.S. Okay, so campusfrance.org? Yes, www.campusfrance.org. Okay, so um, that helps for U.S. students wanting to go to France and likewise for French students wanting to come to the United States. Do you know of similar websites for um, other countries, either U.S. going to uh, to travel outside of the United States or for other students who want to come to the United States? Um, yeah, actually, I think I'm showing my screen right now. Um, hopefully, um, people will see there's an online resources here that shows the website for Campus France, mm -hmm. um, also Paris Tech. Um, if you're interested in studying in the UK, uh, there's the British Council on Education, uh, educationuk.org. Um, and then there's also in Germany, um, it's uh, eaad.de. Um, pretty much applying to the schools in France and Germany and the UK is very similar to applying to a US school. Basically, you contact the school, talk to people involved in research that you're interested in, and then they'll, you'll go ahead and start the application process. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you. So you applied, you got accepted, you got over there. What were some of the, oh, biggest headaches or biggest challenges? Was it getting set up and just kind of getting integrated into a new life in a new country? Was it harder in France than it, it must have been harder in France than it would have been in the United States? Was it getting integrated into your uh, laboratory research group, or, or maybe you can elaborate on some of the challenges? We've talked about some of the advantages. Yeah, some of the challenges, um, specifically um, the two, integrating actually into the research group was actually very easy to do. Um, pretty much just, it, it's right now English is the scientific presentation language. Um, so if you go to conferences here, Europe, wherever, a lot more likely than not, they're going to be in English. So actually integrating into the group was very easy. Um, integrating into the school, a bit more challenging because of the, of the language barrier. I actually speak practically no French. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, when I first came over here, I spoke, basically I could say hello. Uh, and I could say thank you, and basically what I would consider a survival world in, that lang in any language. Hello, thank um, excuse me, and please. Um, that's all I could speak. Um, I speak more now. I can actually order my dinner. I go out to the <laughs> restaurant. I can order my dinner. I can read a menu without additional help. Mm -hmm. um, and the people here in France are great. As long as you, and, and I found that and no matter where I'm at, whether France, Poland, Czech, as long as you attempt to speak the language, even if you murder it, which my pronunciation of French is horrid, even if you murder it, they really do appreciate the fact that you're trying. And so they will help. Okay. So you don't think students should be intimidated from applying to one of these programs, even though they aren't fluent in the language or even a, you know, proficient in the language. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think they should be intimidated at all. Now, admittedly, the more you know, the, the easier it will be. Um, and then uh, same thing, the other problem, like on the bureaucratic side, all French government websites are in French, and they do not offer a translation into English. Now, mind you, Google Translate is great. Sure. But that can be difficult uh, even to get across the meaning. Um, so the more you know, the better. But learning language is actually not that hard. It is probably the one of the easier things that the bureaucracy was more difficult than learning the language. Interesting. Did you find the style of uh, the working lifestyle of students to be different in France than it was in the United States? Say, pardon? Yes. Um, one thing, there are a couple things in particular. Um, 
in the U.S. as a graduate student, I have been known to work all hours of the day. I mean, you go and go in the lab at 2 in the morning if you have to. You don't really want to, but it's, it's been known to happen. Sure. Um, that does not happen here in France. Um, actually, at 7 o'clock, like, for example, I could technically go in the lab at 2. I do have my keys. I can get access. But I can't do anything because they will actually shut off uh, components to the lab. For example, I have a, I work on a sputtering system. We have shutters for the targets to open and close that are run by air, compressed air. Um, they will shut off the compressed air at 7 p.m. Interesting. So you cannot work past 7 p.m. at least doing deposition. I mean, I can sit and play on my computer and do that type of stuff, uh, but I can do that in my apartment. Um, the same thing on weekends. You cannot. You do not work weekends. Um, same thing on Friday night. They shut it off at 7 p.m. It does not get turned on until Monday morning. Um, lunches are completely different. Uh, the French like to take their time. Uh, actually, it is written in our contracts with the school that we are not allowed to take less than a 45-minute lunch. Really? Are yeah. you, and what happens if you skip lunch? Are you in violation of your contract? Technically, yes, but there's it's I don't have I'm not on a time card, so it's it's not as big of an issue. Sure. Uh, especially as a, as a student, it's not such big of an issue. If I were as a postdoc or a technician, it probably would be a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, I have acquired the I like taking an hour lunch now. I in the states, I will I've been known to sit and work through my lunches. Um, I don't do that here. Interesting. Um, so there is that adaptation. Did that kind of raise an eyebrow when you came back to the States with your professors here at UAB? Um, luckily not for my advisor, um, partly because my advisor actually was, uh, is a for, well, he's U.S. citizen now, but he was born in Minsk. Um, he has a lot of, actually we have a lot of international work that we've done since I've joined him. I've actually been from this side of Europe to the other um, four or five different times. Um, so he knows there are cultural differences and he accepts it. And to be honest, when I go back to the U.S., I tend to very quickly get back into the swing of things going there, meaning I start working through my lunches again. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it, it, for at least for my particular case, it, it wasn't a big issue. But I could see, yes, that if you have somebody who doesn't have a lot of international experience as your advisor, mm -hmm. um, that may be an issue. That, that could easily be an issue. Now, I have to, I'm hearing about these wonderful long lunches you know, in comparison while you're in France, but you also have this set in stone defense deadline. Um, right. What happens if you don't make that defense deadline? I will have to apply for an extension, okay. um, which, just like in the U.S., it's not exactly, they, it is unlikely, it probably, it would be highly unlikely for it to get denied. They don't like to do it, but if you have to, they will. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a, a colleague of mine, a, a French student, who is technically in his fourth year, whereas in France, it's typically it's a three-year program. Um, and he's actually in his fourth year. He had to actually extend for an entire year uh, because he actually had to end up changing projects uh, and advisors because his prior advisor retired. Okay. <laughs> so it it, it 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 can still be done and, and worked around. It's it's not they don't like to do it, but they will do it. They do. They are. I have found the French to be very practical. I mean, I have it set in stone, but everybody realizes that stuff happens. Did you feel like you were as productive, even with all of these longer breaks and things like that? Did you feel like your uh, uh, productivity was the same in France as it was in the United States? Most of the, well, most of the time. There are always exceptions. Um, like, for example, last year um, we have one deposition system for four or five of us. So course scheduling sometimes, like last year, I ended up sitting for a month uh, because somebody else was doing the deposition equipment. And 
Clooney, where I'm at, the particular center I'm at, Paris Tech has eight different centers. I'm at Clooney. Um, and we don't have a lot of characterization equipment here. Mm -hmm. um, we have the deposition system, we have an XRV, and we have a variable temperature turbometer for doing friction measurements. That's about it. Um, so if we want to do any hardness testing or if we want to do other testing, even grazing angle uh, x-ray diffraction, we have to send the samples out um, to other Paris Tech centers. So it doesn't actually cost us anything. But obviously if I'm not making samples, I don't have them to send. So I, had, I was basically twiddling my thumbs for a month. Which whereas in the States, I actually have more characterization equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't sit as often. Um, but as far as when I'm actually working, the productivity level is, is about the same, even with the longer lunches and, and the uh, cutoff at 7 p.m. Okay. Interesting. Now, I want to announce to the listeners that our Q&A uh, portion of the broadcast is about is starting now, so please feel free to email Mike some of your hard questions. So, Mike, I'm giving you a hard time here. But um, we already have one, and one of them is, if you participate in such a program, what are the income options such as work and study, and how does that compare to similar options in the United States? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm assuming they're asking how much I get paid. Well, probably, you know, some of the assistantship, some of the options. Yeah, um, it, it, it actually, it, it's kind of funny. I get actually, um, it, it's split. Um, when I'm in the U.S., I'm actually on a, a grant from my professor, uh, and I get paid on a U.S. stipend there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, it's, UAB is pretty competitive, at least in the southeast. Um, with their stipends, so I make it, you know, I don't want to call it decent living, but I can live. Um, when I'm here in France, I get paid by the local regional council, uh, the regional council of Burgundy. Um, basically, it's, I guess the closest equivalent would be, a, it's state, basically like state government would be the closest equivalent to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a grant through them, and I get paid uh, about the same, actually. It, it, it's very comparable to what I make in the U.S. Okay. Um, they actually do have a, which is actually funny, I actually make the minimum that is you, the French national government stipulates that there is a minimum salary that schools have to pay for research assistantships. Um, one thing is typically when you apply to the French institutions, they want you to have that before they will give you the acceptance letter, you need to have that funding for your full three years lined up. Mm -hmm. um, that's not as bad as, like, for example, um, if you go to the Campus France website, they have numerous options for students. To, I think they list something on the order of 300 grant programs for doctoral students uh, to go through. The French national government gives uh, what they call mobility grants, specifically for Coutoutals. Um, so there are actually quite a few options. I would actually say there's probably more options to get funded here than there are necessarily in the States. Mm. Um, at least in the one like back in the States, as, a, as when you first start, you're on the TA, like almost everybody else. But your RA, your research, is always contingent on the grants that your professor has. Mm -hmm. um, or almost always. Obviously, there's different, like GAN and different other programs that you can apply through, NASA, EPSCoR, all that lovely stuff. Um, but they're not, they're actually more, it seems to me that there are more opportunities for individuals to go ahead and get that grant money here and here in France than there are in the States now. I'm not sure if that's true, but at, le at least it seems to me. And you found, even though that the, you know, you said you got paid similar amounts, were your, was your standard of living the same in both places? Or did the yeah. dollar... Well, no, actually, it, it, it's where I'm at in, in Clooney, um, literally, it's basically the prices are change the dollar sign up for a euro sign. Mm -hmm. um, since I'm paid in euros, that's not a big issue. If I was being paid in dollars, that would be an issue because it's $1.33 to the euro, more or less, right now. Um, so if I was paid by the U.S., that could be an issue and would lower my standard of living. But since I'm paid by the French uh, in euros, comparable amounts, and the prices are actually 
is basically take the euro and take the euro sign and dollar sign and exchange them. Uh, I would say the standard of living is actually pretty pretty similar. Um, we have okay. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Hmm. Okay. We have another question from one of our listeners. How does a PhD in Europe relate with that in the United States? It seems like the European ones take a shorter time than the US. And so is the level of knowledge different or the same? Um, as far as the time goes, technically they're the same length. Technically, if you go by the regs and, and whatnot, if you look at your university, individual universities, things, most programs are supposed to be from are, are supposed to be two years for masters and three years for your PhD. Um, so you typically U.S. students you spend five years at a university because you come in with the bachelor's. Whereas here in France you come in with the masters already, so we only have the additional three years. Um, as far as the degrees itself, like obviously the doctorate and the doctorate that's what they call it here, and the PhD are completely interchangeable. Um, the knowledge level. I would say is different. I would say at least from a physics standpoint, for example, um, in many, like I have a friend who did it in the Netherlands, in many European nation, European and many European, European schools, you're not actually, they don't have qualifying exams. You're not typically, I think except the UK, I think the UK does, but I know France does not, and I don't think Germany does either. You don't have qualifying exams. You're not actually required to take um, a significant amount of courses. Um, so you do have to, I mean, you have to pass so many European credit hours, mm -hmm. um, which most of that is done, classwork done is that done at your master's level. And then once you're at the PhD level, uh, basically you're, you're free to do whatever. Um, most of your research, most of your credit hours will come from research. So I would say, at least from my standpoint, um, I would say the knowledge level on the U.S. is a little bit more broad mm -hmm. because you're required, as a physicist, we're required to take solid state. We're required to take condensed matter, or not condensed matter, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, electrodynamics, stat mech. Whereas here in Europe, you only take those courses that are going to be relevant to what you're doing. It's a much more directed. So you don't have that broad base that you do from a U.S. education. Do you feel that you could have gotten through a PhD more quickly had you not pursued this program with Paris Tech? Could you have um, just sort of plowed through it faster? Did this delay your graduation date at all? Um, if, it, if it did, it's only by like six months. Okay. Um, if I had not done this particular degree, the, the dual degree program, I probably would be finishing uh, spring, summer of next year of, of 2012 rather than the fall. So not a significant extension to be And honest. are you accountable to two main advisors? I know when I was doing my graduate work, I had my advisor, and he was the one that I answered to for my PhD research and my deadlines and things like that. And he was the one that yeah, recommended people for my committee. Is that still the same for the dual degree program, or how are things different? Who who are you ultimately accountable to? Um, both. I have a U.S. and a French advisor, and they luckily they know each other. Okay. Um, so that we collaboration is, is not an issue. Um, and basically, it, what happened is that my committee is actually split. I have half French, half U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and my particular case, I will defend at UAB back in the States, and actually my French committee members will fly to the States uh, next October for my defense. Okay. Was there, uh, ever a, was there ever a situation where maybe the two advisors differed in their uh, perspectives on how you should approach something and you're kind of caught in the middle? Um, occasionally, and that's only because actually Paris Tech, or at least the center of Paris Tech and UAB have slightly different thrusts. Mm -hmm. um, at UAB, we are more concerned with the biomed. Uh, we have a very large hospital that we work with a lot, so we do a lot of biomedical devices and, and, and the whatnot and interest in that area, whereas here in uh, Cluny, uh, their materials engineers are focused on cutting tools. 
Now, luckily for me, hard materials I can use for both applications. Um, because, and actually, to be honest, they have similar uh, requirements for the for the coating. So, in that sense, um, sometimes my you know U.S. advisor and my French advisor will have difference of opinions of exactly which way to go mm -hmm. um, with a particular you know part of it. But it uh, usually gets worked out by you know it usually gets worked out. Sure, so, I. Uh, can you give a, an example? And just let me jump in real quick. Uh, to the listeners out there, we would really welcome your questions. So please don't hold back. We think we're going to be able to get to all of them. So um, just type them into the questions box that you see on your screen. And uh, back to Mike, how did you manage that? Can you give a, a sort of an antidote of a time where you had to manage two bosses? <laughs> I hear laughing. I guess that means uh, yes, there was. That's a because trip. actually there was one not that long ago. Um, we have a. I do my nano composites are based on tungsten carbide, um, mm -hmm. and we have four inch magnetron sputtering guns. And the French had ordered a target that contained cobalt. Mm -hmm. It's a cemented tungsten carbide target. Um, cobalt is bad for the biomed side because. We're interested in putting nanocarbon, nanodiamonds in particular, on top of whatever hard coating, nanocomposite coatings I have to make a, a multi-layer system. Cobalt sucks for that because it's a carbon nanotube catalyst. So we have these beautiful pictures of the films just coming right off with these beautiful carbon nanotube forests on the bottom of the nanodiamond films, which obviously we don't want because the adhesion is horrible. So there was uh, quite a bit of back and forth about what to do, whether or not I should use this target or not, because on the cutting tool side, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, it actually might work out to be beneficial, because from an engineering standpoint, the companies want cheaper, and this type of target is significantly cheaper than a pure tungsten carbide target. But on the biomed side, it's not so good. Um, basically. I ended up making the decision, well, let's go ahead and use what we've got. We'll order a new target, but we'll use what we've got. And we may even try with the Biomed to see if anything interesting happens. Um, but that would be, I think, the most recent thing uh, mm -hmm. of where I've had to manage the two. Now, for the people out there that are considering such an experience, um, it was, we're in the last minutes here. What would you say should be the factors that should go into their decision making about pursuing a, a dual degree program? Because you can give them this advice in retrospect. So how do you think they should approach the analysis as to whether or not this is right for them? First off, look for some place where the the goals basically match your own. I mean, the PhDs are too painful not to love what you do. Um, so, and since you're now going to be doing it at two schools, both schools have to have something that you love, mm -hmm. um, something that you love doing. Um, whether and, and and with regards to work. Um, and the other thing is realize that when you're doing this, that you will be spending half your time in Europe, half your time in the states, or or wherever the crew hotel is at. And that can be an interesting juggle for family. Um, for mm -hmm. example, I'm married. Um, my wife is actually still in the States um, because actually we're trying to sell our house and it hasn't happened yet. Um, so she's still in the States, which is very difficult to, to manage um, a, a long distance relationship. Um, that would be, the biggest thing is, is low, you have to find something that both schools offer that that match up to you. Don't go just because, oh, it's a co tutor, I'm going to get two degrees. Because in the end, the knowledge that you get has to be useful. In other words, the degree is not, mm -hmm. um, no matter what you do with it. So you have to have stuff that you love because you're going to be spending time at both, a lot of it. We have a question from the audience, and one of the uh, one of the members of the audience asks. With uh, I understand that there are mandatory two vacation days per month or so in France. How did that affect your lab schedule? 
it screws it all up. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it's it's two per month. I do know they take vacations a lot. Uh huh. Um, for example, they're on vacation right now. This week is a is basically the fall break for the students. Um, most of the technicians and most of the most of the staff is still at the school, so we haven't had anything shut down. Mm -hmm. um, such as like the, the compressed air for our deposition systems, we can still work because most of the technicians are also still there. Uh, it's mainly vacation for the students. Um, however, like for example, in the summer, um, basically the entire, almost the entire month of August, the, everything is practically shut down. That is holiday time for the French. Um, so for example, to get around that, we literally actually hooked up a air compressor directly to the system. That's interesting. So One there of our, are ways, oops, I'm sorry. ways around it. One of our audience members, just as you were saying that, they were typing in the Netherlands that was the same situation. They took basically the entire month of August off. So. Oh, yeah, it, and it's ridiculous. Like, actually, it's given me more headaches. Experimental-wise, it's not so bad, but it's given me a lot of headaches with regards to administrative work. Oh, because obviously, depending on, like right now, actually, to be honest, I have some administrative paperwork that is sitting in Paris, but I know I will not hear anything about it till after this, till after the second, because they're on vacation till the second of November. I see. We and have about the of staff tends to take off. Okay. Well, we've got 10 minutes until the end, so I invite the audience to continue submitting questions and. Mike, one of the things that was crossing my mind as you were talking about managing a long-distance relationship is as you go back and forth, what do you do with your housing? I think that could be intimidating to a lot of people. Do you have an apartment that you're able to maintain in France even though you're over here, or do you have to begin the process over again each time you go over there? Um, basically, well, since I'm over here, like, for example, when I was over here the first time for the six months, I actually lived in the student dorms. Mm -hmm. Um, which was very convenient because one, it's cheap, and two, it, it's very easy to to leave and, and to come and go. Meaning that it's, you're not fixed into a lease. Um, this time around, since I'm here for a full year, I have an apartment that I've that I've rented. Um, and and the, but basically, that the the best way to handle it because it would be at least for me, from from my perspective, monetarily, uh, is just to go ahead and start the process over. When, like, actually, this apartment, um, my advisor found for me. We had her starting looking in, I think, June or no, March or June, and she actually found this apartment for us, for me. Um, and and that this, that way, I didn't have to worry about it because I was coming in September when all the students would have already taken all the cheap apartments. Okay. Well, so. and you know, one of the things when you mentioned your advisor, you used the word her. And I was going to ask you, did you notice a difference in, say, the diversity of scientists in France than you might in the United States? No, actually, it, it is uh, kind of funny that they have the same problems of getting women and minorities involved in sciences that we do. Um, like, for example, here in Cluny, we have Corinne, she's my advisor, she is the only female uh, we'll take it back. There are two female faculty members, her and the mathematician. Um, they don't really have a math department. She's here just to teach their, the math necessary for the undergraduate. Um, and that's about it, whereas, you know, it, it, same thing, it's very much male-dominated uh, as far as the field. I mean, they have the same problems of getting women involved uh, and women and minorities involved in the sciences that we do in the States. When I was in graduate school, one of the things that I particularly enjoyed was the international diversity of the PhD student environment. I believe as a US graduate student that really was broadening in my experiences and it also was interesting in that I would often be called a minority because I was an American. In France, did you find the same international diversity in the research environment and the research groups there? That I did, actually. Um, for example, with Paris Tech, Paris Tech, I think I have the number here, has something on the order of 25,000 PhDs, or 2,500, I'm sorry, 2,500 PhD students for Paris Tech, and 40% of us are international students. Um, here in Cluny, there are only, we have about 
it's a small school, small center. Um, we have about 15 doctoral students, all of which are co-tutels. And only one, two, three, I think out of that only three are actually French. Interesting. The remainder are mostly from Maghreb or North African countries, um, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, I think we actually even have one Libyan, although I have not seen him in the next few weeks. Um, but so we do, we do have that diversity. Um, I'm, a, I'm the token. There are actually two Americans here at Clooney, myself and one lady who teaches in the language lab. So I'm basically the token American student. So I'm a minority here too, um, because in most U.S. physics, like you said, most U.S. physics departments, Americans tend to be in the minority. Yeah. Now, if you were you were talking about your wife, if you were bringing a spouse with you to France, what would be their work options? Would they need some sort of work permit or work visa, or what would be they would be prevented from doing? Well, actually, the I just actually found this out a couple months ago. The interesting thing is that as a doctoral student, you're not on a student visa. You're actually on what they call a scientific visa, mm -hmm. so which is the same visa they give postdocs. You're considered a researcher rather than a student, at least as far as the government, as far as the visa and immigration is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, the bad part about that is that it's a lot more expensive of a permit. It's mm -hmm. 340 euros versus 55. I see. The good part about that is for those of us who are married and doing this, when my wife comes over, she will actually get a what they get, a family visa, and as such, she is permitted to work. That's With huge. That. Whereas if I was a student, she would have to get a visitor's visa, which does not allow her to work. That's huge. So that it, it is a huge plus, to be honest. And yeah, so, it's a huge yeah. plus because my wife would go nuts if she came over here and couldn't work. <laughs> and can you repeat what type of visa one should make sure they should apply for? Sci scientific. A scientific, scientific visa. visa. We'll do a long stay scientific visa. As opposed uh, to a the, student visa. That's correct. Important. And the, 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 visa, the visa itself costs $136 right now. I just looked at the French embassy web or consulate website this morning. Um, it's $136. That visa is good for two months. Actually, take that three months. Once you get here in France, you're as a long stay visa, you're required to apply for what they call the carte de séjour, which is a temporary residency permit. Um, it's good for one year, and that costs 340 euros. Is anyone who's doing the dual degree in France eligible for the scientific visa? Yes, basically, as, as as a doctoral student, that's what you're required to get. So all of my colleagues who are Tunisian, Moroccan, they're also on scientific visas rather than student. Okay, that was a question from one of our audience members, and we have a few more moments in the Q and A portion. So again, I invite the audience to submit questions. Um, as how long did it take you to get your visa? The visa itself from the consulate, um, which you have to go to a consulate that you're actually the French embassy does not issue visas. So even if you live in the D.C. area, you go to a French consulate. I think it's in D.C. also, um, and they will issue the visa. The visa itself as a U.S. citizen took about two weeks. You know, and we hear about such nightmare stories in the United States. <laughs> Two weeks yeah. sounds wonderful. You no, know, I actually have a colleague, she's in China because she has to renew her visa. and She's worried it's going to take two months. Yeah. Now, are there, um, we have a, another couple questions from the audience. Do you know if similar visa scenarios exist in other countries where a scientific visa will enable the spouse to work? I actually have, I would assume so. I really don't have any idea. I would assume so, at least in uh, Shenzhen zone, i.e. Germany, U uh, not UK, but mm -hmm. uh, basically the open borders of Europe. I would, I would imagine, because they all have very similar immigration policies because of the Shenzhen agreement, mm -hmm. um, that they would have similar visas, but I do not know that for sure. 
Now, for your international colleagues, when you're at UAB, do you know what type of visa your international colleagues come over um, to the United States? What type of visa they, they use and what the spouse work opportunities are for, for them? Um, I do know it is a student visa. I forget what the actual letter is. I want to say F, but I could be mistaken. Yeah, F is um, the student visa, and F. J is the scholar visa. And I wasn't sure which ones would come over as PhD students, whether they'd come um, over as I students. know my colleagues, at least my colleagues that I've worked with, both at UA and UAB, they had F visas. Okay. They had student visas. Postdocs have Js. I, okay. I know postdocs will get a J. Um, I have no idea what the work options for spouses are on an F visa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what about a J visa? Yeah. Yeah. And so we are asking, you know, what are the, clarify the differences between the F and J visas. I have a little bit of insight to that, but maybe you want to mention that? I, to be honest, I, being the fact that I'm a U.S. citizen, I, I really don't know <laughs> anything, to be honest. Sure. We deal with visa issues in the United States here, and the F visa is for students themselves, and the J visa is for what's identified as scholars. So this is after your graduation. So, um, And then with uh, J visas, there's also the ability to uh, renew without the extra security clearance that is undertaken initially for certain scientific fields. So there's a little bit of a streamlining because for the visa processing for some of the J um, visa applicants, uh, just because if you've gone through the security clearance once, then it, well, you don't have to go through it again for a certain period of time. But in a nutshell, F is for students and J is for scholars. Um, and that was a question from the audience. And so are there any, any more questions? We're about to wrap up here. Any last-minute questions from the audience? We certainly welcome them. And in the meantime, Mike, let me get some parting thoughts from you. If you were to be talking to your buddy in a bar and he were to say, well, what is your biggest takeaway from this experience? What would, what would be the first thing that would pop into your head? We know all of the benefits educationally and career opportunities, but what made the biggest impression on you? People are the same no matter where you go. Interesting. Uh, I have been, like I said, I've been to Finland, I've been to Poland, Czech, Fran I'm here in France, um, Canada, UK. And it's a, it's amazing how similar people are. Um, obviously, there you know there are always little little things, cultural differences, but people in general tend to be very, very, very much the same. Very helpful um, if they can be, as long as you also make an effort to be polite. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to wrap up on that note. And let me just sort of summarize what I saw as some of the takeaways for people who might be considering these programs is the coup de tel is a dual degree program between a US university and another university overseas for those of us in the United States and if you're overseas it could be between any two universities yours just happened to be between UAB and Paris Tech and for researching opportunities there are a couple links that you put up that will be available in the archives of this particular webcast and webinar rather and that people should not be intimidated by the fact that they don't um, speak the language that that was not a barrier to you and that the cultural differences well they were interesting they were not problematic per se and that this has been a wonderful experience in what I'm gathering um, a tremendous opportunity career-wise. And is there anything else that you'd like to add, Mike? No, that uh, actually is a good summary uh, of it overall, and the online resources are on the screen right now. So, and the I just, I just want to say to anyone else that might be listening after the fact, after we hang up here, but in the archives, you can 
By all means, follow up with additional questions you might have by sending them to webinars, that's webinars plural, at APS.org. Webinars at APS.org. So on behalf of APS, Mike, thank you so much for talking to us. And be, um, to all of our listeners out there, we really appreciate your interest, and we welcome any suggestions you might have for future webinars. And again, please don't hesitate to send in your additional questions. So thank you all again, and that concludes the broadcast. Yes, um, I'm just going to break in really quick just to remind everyone, please, as you exit the webinar today, please uh, fill out the survey to help us uh, plan future webinars and get your feedback. Thanks a lot. All thank right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. <laughs>